I hope I hope the TV behind me skipped. I got it on. <laughs> I got it on our channel. Hopefully it skipped over. I saw the commercial come on. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. It's right on point. What's going on, everybody? A2D Radio. This is Bennett. I'm Murphy Fry, and we've got not the tank, but we got Tom, our known on with us tonight, filling in for the tank. What's going on, Big Tom? What's up, Irv? I'm now. I'm excited to be here. Let's let's to talk Eagles football with you. And we're brought to you by Philly Sports Strips. So you can Philly baseball right around the corner. You go book your getaway for Philly season, phillysportstrips.com. Go check them out. And obviously, they got you covered for everything Eagles. You want to go to Brazil? They can take you to Brazil. <laughs> phillysportstrips.com. Are, are you going to Brazil? Are you going to go to Brazil? I'm not going to Brazil, but I would I, I would be interested in going to Brazil for sure. <laughs> can you tell me – why are you? I'm gonna tell you why I'm not going to Brazil. Why are you not going to Brazil? It's hard enough to get me to go to the link half the time, and that's <laughs> and that's around the block. And then we're talking, you know, Brazil's a, a you know, pretty little further than than the link. Yeah, it's a whole lot further. <laughs> um, so why don't you go to the link? Is it the, is it the crowds? Is it the cost? Uh, what exactly is it that that? Because I don't like going to, to the games either. I mean, I'm I'm with you. I don't like the crowds. I can't deal with a lot of people. I don't like the whole, you know, cattle herding people. It looks like they're herding cattle into the stalls before the games. I just, I don't like dealing with that. I mean, people say, well, yeah, you played and you were there all the Yeah, but I got there early. I had my own entrance and I left late. I didn't have to deal with crowds. Even when we we're flying on the planes, we have to deal with the crowds. So why, why? Is it that you don't like to go to the games? Well, those two things obviously are <laughs> right up there, right? It's just uh-huh. it's too much. It's too much. And I started doing post game shows, so that would right. that's that's a mess. And I always felt like I can see more watching it at home, right? I remember more watching it at home too. For some reason, right. you know, going to games, I remember stuff, and I I feel like I will see stuff better at times. Obviously, uh-huh. there's things you're going to see right. better, you know, at the game than you won't see on TV. But right. I don't remember as much. When I watch it at home, I feel like I remember everything. It, it's weird. But there are my reasons well, you, why I, I don't like going. Yeah, you do. You get a chance to notice. Uh, myself, I noticed when I went to – I did go to a couple of games this year, or this past year, I should say. I went to the Miami game. I went to the uh, to the Minnesota game, and I was sitting in the end zone. Uh, one of the things that I didn't like, obviously, is the other areas in terms of shoveling people in and the crowd and all. But then you got to stand up when everybody stands up. You can't see unless you sit, you know, unless you stand up when everybody's standing up. But one of the things that I did notice in that game against Miami, I'm watching Tyreek Hill because I really wanted to, you know, get a feel for how he plays and how he runs routes, how he carries himself, you know, his demeanor, all that kind of stuff. I saw I was watching him very closely in that game. And he literally, to me, he didn't want to play in that game. That was one of the reasons I believe the Eagles were able to shut them down uh offensively the way they did was because Tyreek Hill at a couple of pivotal points in that game where they needed a first down where they were driving the ball the Dolphins were against our defense and Tyreek was asked by the coach to go in the game and he's on the sidelines he's shaking his head no and I'm looking at him I don't know if he was feeling bad if he was sick if he was hurt or what but he was really disengaged from that game he was not as engaged or as intense in that game as he had been in other games. So it was really interesting to me to watch him during that game to see his demeanor and his countenance on the sidelines, which obviously carried over to the field because they got shut down in that particular game against the Eagles. Yeah, and you're not going to see that at home, watching on TV. No. And sometimes you're not going to see – you're not going to know what coverages teams are running at times or, like, who was open, right? You might see it on a replay back and be like, oh, he was open. But, you know, you'll see that at a game, watching it live – in in house, then you're not going to see on the TV. So that, right. That's an advantage right. of being there. But unless you could somehow say, "Tom, we'll, we're going to get a helicopter, we'll fly you in, we're going to just going <laughs> to drop you in, and then we're going to pick you right up out, and you can leave right after the game's over, and you can sit where nobody's going to bother you, and you can enjoy watching the game." I'm in. <laughs> ain't going to happen. No, nope. ain't going ain't going to happen. <laughs> just not going to happen. So, man, listen, thanks. Um, just so everybody knows, I know this is not the night that we normally come on, the, t- the, this, the time we come on, but this is not the night that we usually come on on HUD Radio. Normally, Vetted comes on on Thursday nights at 8.15 p.m. Uh, I had a horrific 
uh, time on Thursday. I'm down in North Carolina right now. Actually, I'm in Georgia. I'm in Georgia right now, my brother-in-law's house. I brought my mom down to see some of her relatives. I'm going to go to church on Sunday, one of our church family churches. Um, but I was supposed to get here at 11 a.m. on Thursday, and therefore, plenty of time to do the show Thursday night. Canceled our flight 6 a.m. We were there at the airport at 4 o'clock in the morning. We found out at 4 o'clock in the morning, they canceled our flight. Went back home, slept for a couple of hours, came back. They were moving the boat, you know, the SS, was it, SS uh, New Jersey. They were moving that boat, said they were going to close the bridge. So we had to get there earlier than we wanted to. Went back to the airport. They kept delaying our flight. We ended up flying to Atlanta. And then my wife's brother, who's my brother-in-law, drove to Atlanta airport, three hours from where we are in Augusta, Georgia, picked us up. We had to drive through. We got here at 10 o'clock at night on Thursday. <laughs> just, it was just ridiculous, man. It's been a crazy trip, but I was determined. You know, I know Hollis had something to do on uh, on tonight, but I asked you, Tom, to come on and, and be with me because I was determined to do the show. We're going to do the show. We're not going to let this thing pass by and not get it done. So, one of the things we want to talk about tonight, everybody, is the draft is coming up. We know Howie and the Eagles have been doing a lot, more so than anybody else in the league, a lot in free agency. We can talk about that a little bit later on. But we got a first-round draft choice coming up uh, late April. Who do you or what do you or what position do you think the Eagles need to, based on what they've done, because that's what they do in free agency. They do what they need to do in free agency to try to shape what it is they're going to do in the draft. What do you think, based on what has happened right now up to this point in free agency, what do you think in terms of position the Eagles need to draft in the first round with that first round pick? Yeah, that's that's a tough one, right? Because they can go it's so tough. many different it's directions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know what I, I where I would go, right? Me okay, personally. Where would you, where would you go? Yeah. Would you me go? personally, where I'm going is I'm probably yeah. going corner, depending on who it is, or – you know, I'm I'm a linebacker guy, so if that guy falls into my lap, a guy that I love, then I'll go linebacker. But knowing them, they're going to go tackle, uh, they're going to go offensive tackle, or or tackle. they're going right, or they're going D tackle. Like that, to me, it's a tackle. I smell a tackle first round. <laughs> it's just what, it's what they do. Right. They they haven't. You know, it would be a surprise, I think, to everybody, Philadelphia fans and other fans across who are football fans across the country if the Eagles drafted a linebacker in the first round of the draft, they have not, they just don't do that. They don't do that. Um, but I, I think you're right. You know, based on what they've done thus far, you know, they've tried to fill some of the gaps with some linebackers in free agency and they've done, a, you know, Bryce Huff. They got a couple of good linebackers, Devin White. These guys I think can come in and will play this year and do a decent job. Um, and people are talking about also how it's kind of a roll of a dice. When you talk about Bryce Huff, you talk about uh, Devin White. I mean, Devin, they signed Devin to a one-year deal. They signed Bryce Huff to a three-year deal. But I, you know what? Any of these players are a roll of the dice because football is a game where guys get injured. You just don't know what's going to happen. I think um, getting qualified free agents – who have played at the level in the NFL, at that level, you kind of know what they're already capable of. You know what they're going to do or what they're not going to do because they played at that level. When you're drafting rookies, it's really a, a shot in the dark. E-I, I-E, Jordan Davis. You know, let's talk about Jordan Davis. He's a guy that was drafted in the first round a couple of years ago. Everybody, I didn't hear anybody say anything negative about him. Everybody had positive things to say about him. Everybody who was a Philadelphia Eagles fan thought that he was going to be uh, a difference maker for that defense because of what he brought to the table and what he was able to accomplish in college. But yet and still, he hasn't really done anything. And I think if he goes into the season, I believe if he goes into the season and plays the same way he has his first two years, this upcoming 2024 season, he's going to be considered – a first round bust. Hmm. What do you think? Well, it's funny you say that because a guy that you know, we a guy that got taken before that pick who's playing for the Baltimore Ravens right now could have been the, our pick on, on 
you know, in round one that year, right? Now, right, that right. being said, I liked the pick of Jordan Davis at the time a lot because I really thought he was the big reason for right. for what set Georgia's defense up for success on the back end. For not, you know, especially in college where nobody could run on them. I thought it was a big reason right. for that. But year one, I talked about to being a rookie. I'll buy into being out of shape year one. I thought he had a pretty, I thought he had a pretty good start the year two. I, then I thought like the rest of his defense, he disappeared, right? Definitely right. disappeared. His start right. was good. So there, there's a little promise, but to, your, to the poll, you know, we're going to find out if he's a bust this year because that's like right. his junior year, right? I like always, right. Right. I always like to make that same comparison going and playing in the NFL. Some guys year one, you know, Earth. some guys year one, like rookie year doesn't matter. They're just ready to right. go. They're ready to play. They belong. Right. Other guys, it may take some seasoning, right? And and, I'll, and I allow that process to happen. We've learned that with Brandon Graham. <laughs> allow mm -hmm. the season for a second. See what you have. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not ready to call him a bust yet because I believe this year is going to tell us everything. But does it look like maybe a bust? Yeah, <laughs> it looks like it could be. <laughs> it looks like one. Well, well, he, when you say he started out 2023, good. He did. He was – uh you heard of his name in some of the stats. You know, he was getting involved in stopping the run. You would hear his name in some of the plays in terms of, you know, getting to the quarterback and forcing uh, uh, hurries on the quarterback's behalf. But it was short-lived. You know, it was probably maybe the first four games of the season. The rest of the season, and not just the part of the season where the team in, in its entirety fell off the cliff, but before that, we stopped hearing anything about Jordan Davis. We kept hearing sprinkles about Jalen Carter and him, you know, being a force, him making a difference. But, man, Jordan Davis was quiet. He really didn't do anything. And you're right. It's, we're going to give him the third year, this third year, his junior year, to determine whether or not he's a bust. But in normal circumstances, when you talk about an NFL player, he comes in his rookie year. Um, and he may have a time where he's struggling to try to get adapted to, to that level of game, to that speed of the game, to, to, to the knowledge and the terminology and, and just, you know, what he needs to do overall. Um, but then usually in the NFL, when you have a high caliber player like that, who has been drafted high. He usually makes a big leap between his freshman year and his sophomore year, between his first year, rookie year and his second year. You see a big improvement during that offseason coming into the second year. But we didn't see that. And we thought that we were going to get that from Jordan Davis based on what we did not get in his rookie year. So we haven't seen that in the sophomore year. So with that in mind and the fact that it did not happen, I think, just in my opinion, it's not likely that we're going to see that much of an improvement from here, this from him this coming year. And um yeah, I don't know what the issue is. I do know last year he was getting fined every week because he was overweight, whatever weight they uh, had determined for him. He was over that weight, and he was getting fined every week. I don't know what played into all of that. I don't know why he was overweight. I don't know why he wasn't showing up, showing up on the field. I do know he has the talent, but he's not getting it done. And that's a real disappointment. And that's a decision that the Eagles are going to have to make about Jordan Davis. Do we keep him or do we let him go if he doesn't show up this season? Uh-oh, you went out. I lost you. No, I'm here. I just muted myself. Okay. What? I'm like, well, my you bad. You hit the button. You got excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, no, I hit the button previously when you were going. I, I was so, I, you know, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be, when I was taking a sip, a sip of water or whatever, oh, right? Coffee. I didn't want to be the guy. I don't want to be the or, guy or sipping. Sip or a sip of this. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be the guy, right? <laughs> Mid-talk. Mid but, no, I mean, like, it's he's he's closer to being one, and, and I think their defense is built, or they try to build their defense, especially up front in the middle, and they've had a guy, a guy like Fletcher Cox here forever. I think they believe right. Jalen Carter is going to be that guy, but they were excited to get Jordan Davis because they thought he was going to be the anchor of this entire line and and linebackers and make everybody's job a little bit easier because of the, the amount of blockers he supposedly could take up. And he even though he wasn't a pass rusher, per se, in college, didn't mean he couldn't get pressure. But we only right. seen, like right. you said, we only seen like first four or five games last year. He started 17 games. So he played. He played. It's not like he didn't play. And you know what? 
that's that's a you know what you're right and i think i i knew that but dang where was he for 17 games if he plays he played 17 games you mean to tell me he played 17 games i think i know that uh because he didn't get injured but he 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 participated in all 17 games but where was he what was he doing huh. now you look at what Vic fangio is going to be doing with this defense it's 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 likely they may go to a three four instead of a four three and guess what you got to swell up in the middle as a, as a nose guard you know that's they call him the nose guard that guy in the middle which he can play which he you know he can do he's shown that clog up the middle um make it available you know the alleys available for your linebackers when there's blitzing when there's when they need to show up for the run to stop the run you got to hold it down in the middle he's capable of doing that but will he be able to do it when they go if they go from a four three to a three four where he's got to hold really hold that middle down yeah that's what and that's why he's such an important piece of this year coming up right because he's gonna he's gonna have to be that guy he's gonna have to be those type of nose tackles that you, you think of every three, four defense that you you ever went against or any ones that we've ever watched, you know, you have that staple. You have that guy, that, that nose tackle that just does all the dirty work for everybody else. And that that's what he's supposed to be. That's what right. Jordan Davis is supposed to be and needs to be. When we talk about this defense, yeah. a defense that we've done a, we've done definitely some upgrading with, right? And mm-hmm. I don't think they're finished in any way. Definitely upgraded. But some of those young guys are a big part of what's going to happen next year when we're talking about how good this team is at the end of the season. Right. Right. And um, th- we'll get to the offense in a minute. I was going to, I was going to shift though to the offense. Let's, st- let's stay on the defensive side of the ball. Let's talk about, and Hollis and I were going to talk about this. Let's, let's talk about this whole saga with Hassan Reddick. Um, he's got a year left on his contract. I, you know what? This whole talk that everybody's, you know, bantering about, with regards to he's going to be traded, nobody wants him, the Eagles have put him out in the market. I'm not so sure that all of that's true. I think some of that may be just what the media does to create content so they have something to talk about. Because, yes, the Eagles don't have to do anything. He's under contract. So they don't have to do anything. But And we know Hassan, he, he wanted a new contract last year. But nothing really has to be done. I don't think that, in my opinion, yes, he was the best pass rusher. Yes, Hassan was the Eagles' best, I guess, front lineman last year. He got the most sacks out of anybody last year. So you could arguably say he was the best uh, guy on the line for the Eagles last year. So you don't want to get rid of him. But I don't see the Eagles wanting to trade him. I think, in my opinion, I think the Eagles want to keep him and have him on the team this year. They just don't want to extend his contract. They don't want to give him a new contract. Just play, and let's see what happens. And if you play well, guess what? We know you're going to be, what, would you be 30, 31 next year? Okay, we'll extend your contract if you play well. Or we'll trade you somewhere if you play well, but we want you to play your contract out. And that that makes sense. That makes sense. Trying to build a team to win this year. You're still under contract. Play your contract out. Yeah, he's going to be, he's going to be 30 in September. And I'm September. never – I'm never against guys wanting money, right? I'm never against it. But like right. I said in the video right. the other day, like, then let's get back. If we're going to do it that way, that's why there's incentives and bonuses built in the contracts. Like, if you're outperforming right. it, well, you have bonuses and different things in there to try to, you know, make some of that money up for big years when right. when the money's not equal in it. But with guys like James Bradbury and other guys who had downright awful years last year and disappeared, Ooh. like, yeah, sure, get, let them give money back. And then we can then go give it give it to Hassan Reddick because we can't pay everybody right now. And at the end of the day, he signed the contract three years ago. It's not like he signed it like seven years ago and you're just like, right. hey, I've outperformed this whole thing. It's time for a right. new deal. You just signed it. So, so don't sign it then, right? Because right. nobody else was going to give you more. And I don't think that's the only, that's the reason or if that trade hasn't been made yet because I don't think anybody else is willing to give them that type of money. Just like when you look at Ladarius Sneed, like, okay, somebody was willing to – Pay that, pay, you know, say, we'll take them off your hands and we're going to give you and we're going to sign them to a long term deal. Right. I don't think, I don't know if anybody's pounding the door down to, to sign a, a 30 year old. Not that he's not really good, but I don't think anybody's looking to sign him for a five year deal. Can you believe he went to Tennessee? Yeah, I know. I can't. 
Can you I can't, I guess. When I saw that, I'm like, really, just because of money, you went and you're not going to win now. You're on, you're on a world championship team that that really right now, if you look at what's happening across the league, they're still kind of favored to win the ten, the, to, the three P. That's what <laughs> that's that's what they tell they're going to do. They're going to three P. But my goodness, why would you go because of money? I mean, how much money do you need? My gosh. And he goes to a team like Tennessee. My goodness, that just it's ridiculous how money is making a diff or changing the the ebbs and the flows of teams in the NFL. A guy goes to Tennessee because he's going to get paid rather than staying. What do you think if I'm a guy who's on the Kansas City Chiefs right now, right? What do you think is going to do more for me when I retire? Going to another team and making more money and not winning or staying with the Kansas City Chiefs, maybe making a couple hundred, a couple million dollars less, but winning three or four more championships. What do you think is going to matter the most when I retire? Those championships. Those championships. Nobody's going to remember Sneed anymore now. When he goes to Tennessee, he'll be forgotten about. <laughs> Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs will continue to rise. They will continue to win. They'll continue to be a factor for the next three or four years in the NFL, but the team to beat for the next three or four years in the NFL, and Sneed will be forgotten about. Oh, absolutely. You ride, you ride Mahomes' coattails as long as you can ride them. You know, you stay yes. on, on that winning train as long as you can because now you go down as a folk hero, right? And you start talking folk that's hero right. status, right? You never have to pay for a drink in a city ever again. So and that's, you know, you what, don't, you don't that's what matters. Yeah, that's what matters most when you're finished playing football. You won all those championships. And like you said, never have to pay for a drink for the rest of your life. Stay in Kansas City and live like a king. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, but you're right. They don't have to, you know, like I said, in my opinion, I'm not, I haven't heard anything from the Eagles saying, okay, we want to trade Hassan Reddick. I think that was just something that was conjured up by the media to create content for these different shows to give us something to talk about. Because why would the Eagles want to trade him? Why would they want to trade him? They're not going to get, if they are trying to trade him, obviously they're not getting what they want for him. But I would want him to stay on the team. He's on the contract. And yeah, there have been times in the past, and I guess this people say it's good business, or some of the sports experts say it's good business to extend the contract instead of let, letting them play the contract out. Well, there's some circumstances where you need to let the player, or it's better business to let the player play the contract out, and let's see what we have at the end of the contract. And I think that's the case right now with regards to how the Eagles are thinking with Hassan Reddick. Because again, he is a little bit older. He's 30 years old. He'll be 30 years old, like you said, in September. And he's a great pass rusher. But Hassan Reddick is, not, is not a great run stopper. He's not great at stopping the edge. We saw that as the team fell off the latter part of the season last year. He was really exposed in that area when teams just began to run the ball all over <laughs> our defense, yeah. trying to just do whatever they wanted to do. And we saw him get exposed. He wasn't that good against setting the edge. So uh, there's there's a weakness in his game. So I, I don't think the Eagles are trying to trade him. I think the Eagles want to keep him and just let him play out his contract because, again, he was one of the shining stars on last year's defensive side of the ball with the Eagles, um, which which there weren't many shining stars. No, and even him, Irv, to your point, like even him, he's a guy – I get it, he had 11 sacks last year, but he's a guy who even you know disappeared towards the end. Right, I I, yeah. I feel like he was a little milk cartonish, like everybody else was on that defense, <laughs> right? And that's just the way. And I get it, like that's contagious too. Sacks are contagious, you know. Taking the right. football away is contagious. All those things start to become contagious, and bad right. football is contagious too. And that's where they they got on the bad football side of, of that illness, which is not a good thing. But like even that heat, look at Howie Roseman. Howie Roseman's not going to play at the end, twenty five million dollars. Right, right now, a year. So that's just not going to happen unless that no. guy is that good two ways, right? To your point, he's that good at not only getting after the quarterback, but he's also that good of being a run stopper where he never has to take him off the field because he looks at a guy like Bryce Huff and says, well, I can pay this guy pennies on a dollar compared to what I can pay you. And look at his pressures in half the snaps. He had a half a sack less than you 
in half in half the snaps. That's mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know that's Howie being Howie. I don't always agree with him, but on this one, I agree with the Eagles. Like I stand put. You're under contract. You get a year left. The only reason I would say that these trade rumors are coming out is because you know maybe Hassan said. Listen, I'm not going to play unless I get a new deal. I don't know, and I also don't want to put that out if that was never right, said. But that right. was my only guess right. as to right. what that is because the Eagles said we'll 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 give them permission to seek a trade because we're not willing to extend them right now. So I think that's where right. it all started. But to your point, you know, the media is always looking for something. <laughs> of course, we we make stuff yeah. up all the time. But, all but the time. you know what? I think last year Hassan did say he wanted to get and you know he wanted to redo his contract. But like you said. He got a three-year deal. You just signed a contract. What are you talking about redoing your deal? Because he had a bunch of sacks last year, had a great year last year. They went to, I'm talking about 2022, where they yep. went to the Super Bowl and all that, you know, so everybody's looking for more money because everybody wants to get paid. But no, you just signed a contract. What are you looking for more money now? You should have thought about that before you signed it. And if you didn't like the contract or if you could have foreseen that, you know, it's, it's obvious you intended on coming to the field and putting up numbers in terms of sacks on the field and doing having a great job and the team doing well. So that was your intention when you came in. So maybe you should have foresaw that and thought about that before you signed the contract and maybe asked for more money before you, you know, solidified the deal. But um, I, I, you know what? I think Hassan, I think it would be a great, great thing if Hassan remains here in Philadelphia with the Eagles and plays on this team. Listen, this team, in my opinion, Going into the season last year, in my opinion, they had a four-year window, a four-year window where they could uh, compete for the NFC East and go deep into the playoffs and have an opportunity to play for the Super Bowl, play in the Super Bowl. Four years. Obviously, we messed the second year up. That was last year, this year, this 2023. We messed that up in 2023. Because the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, Sean Desai, Brian Johnson, they just – they screwed it up. They really did. They, 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 they messed it up. They messed these players up. Offensively, we ended up just doing nothing. Same talent. We didn't have any problems on offense. They had problems on defense in terms of talent, in terms of schematics. They had problems in terms of what they were doing, in terms of uh, their, their defensive coordinator, his ability, Desai's ability to call – plays in heated situations so they had some issues there but offensively as far as the talent as far as personnel we didn't have any problems there weren't any changes so I don't know what Brian Johnson's problem was I don't know if it was because Sirianni was was overwhelmed what was going on offensively and he just wasn't able to make decisions in those heated situations when things started going downhill for the entire team um it looked like that at, at times because they would get in crucial situations and throw a bubble screen. That just didn't make sense to me at all. Why, why are you throwing a bubble screen? <laughs> that, that was their answer, it seemed like, to, to, to crucial situations. Throw to a everything? Screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was their answer. So it, 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 that means to me they're overwhelmed. And anytime you get in a situation, it reminds me back when I was playing for Ray Rhodes. It was my third year, which was my worst year, or the teams, we had a bad year. My third year in philly they uh john gruden they had let john gruden go he had been the offensive coordinator for my first two years in philly he went out to uh to the raiders and became the head coach so they brought a cat in by the name of dana bible do you remember him yep good gosh man i'm thinking you know i'm a christian so i'm thinking they brought a guy in by the name of bible it's gonna be good i'm stupid (laughs) so they brought dana bible in right and, um, you know, we go through training camp. And I this was the first sign of things going bad. John Gruden was doing a good job with Bobby Hoeing. Bobby Hoeing supposed to be the next answer for the Philadelphia Eagles quarterback. You know, Ty Detmer had been there. Rodney Pete was playing there. Bobby Hoeing was supposed to be the answer over and above Rodney Pete and Ty Detmer. So now Bobby Hoeing's playing the end of my second year. John Gruden's doing a good job with him. Bobby played pretty well. So going into my third year, now Dana Bible has Bobby Bobby Hoeing. We go into training camp. We do our installations in training camp. Now we're getting ready to start the first game of the season. Dana Bible starts putting in all new offensive plays. None of the stuff we ran in training camp, we're going to run in this game. We're running all new stuff. 
that was a sign to me. I'm like, what are you, what are we doing? That you can't do that. And we started how you, out. How do you get a job? Yeah. How do you get a job? There? Like, That's my a- question too. He must he must have pictures of somebody or something. I don't know how he got the job there. He must have had some pictures of of Tom Modrak or Jeffrey Lurie doing something they ain't had no business doing because I don't know how he talked his way into that job because that cat, Dana Bible, knew nothing about offensive play calling, offensive schemes, offensive, none, none of that. We go into the first game of the season, we get killed. So now we're getting, we're getting trounced. And it's about not quite halfway, yeah, about halfway into the season. We had just gotten beat. I come in uh, on Wednesday morning. You know, we come in Monday, watch the film. Tuesday, we have off. Come in Wednesday morning for our installation. I go in the offensive room, and Musgrave, he was the quarterback's assistant coach. His name was Musgrave. Remember him? Yeah. He's up in the front doing the installation for the offensive scheme that particular week, particular week. So we had, they had fired Dana Bible, and he was – they didn't let the press know. They didn't let the public know. But he was demoted. And all he was doing, all Dana Bible was doing, he started that particular day. We went out to practice. He would spot the ball in practice. That's it. He wasn't doing anything else. He was out there spotting the ball for the offense on practice. 20-yard line, 25-yard line, 30-yard line, 35-yard line. He would spot the ball. That's all he was doing. He wasn't, he wasn't participating in any installation, any call playing, nothing. Musgrave was the play caller. So Musgrave is doing the installation, right? He's stuttering. He's babbling. He's stopping. He's stammering. Then he, he stops and he apologizes to us. He says, listen, guys, I'm sorry. I apologize. I've never done this before. This is my first time ever doing it. Yeah, you, you, I see you looking. That's the same look I had. I'm thinking to myself, we just went from bad to worse. Now, I said all that to say this. That's kind of the same thing that happened to the defensive side of the ball when Matt Patricia was given the, 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 the reins three quarters of the way through the season. And he started trying to do installation of defensive plays and schemes that he had been doing and changed everything that they had already been doing. That's why you saw some of these cats all over the place, wide guys running wide open down the field, Defensive backs and linebackers running into each other. Guys just looking like they're not giving effort because they just – they did give up. They did stop playing. Why? Because they didn't know what they were doing. They went from bad to worse. You can't – anytime you have a defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator change in the middle of the season, you can have a, you can have a head coach change in the middle of the season. Yeah. But you have a defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator change in the middle of the season, that creates chaos. That's what this team, the Eagles, went through last year. I was reminded of that when I saw that, and it just it went. We went from bad to worse. It was horrible, Tom. It was horrible. That well, we were scratching we and clawing. That. Yeah, but I remember. Yeah. I remember that year too. By the way, like I, I do remember that year, and now it may all make sense because that was the year Bobby Hoying we thought was going to be like the next guy here for us, right? I remember. Right, I just right. remember talks on the radio. Talking to buddies in school, it was like, oh, I made an yeah. show Montana, right? Like, we, like, oh, we got Montana, we got Montana. Yeah, you know, we're idiots here, so you know. And I was, and I was young, <laughs> right? But I feel like that was talked about on the radio too, which isn't shocking. So, uh, but but it's it's funny. It's funny it, it, now you know that now it really does tie in to what we watch here with Matt Patricia because that's not fair to anybody on the defense side of the football, right. you know. So now right. when you hear guys talk about that after the season, you know, it's not excuse driven. Like Slay saying it, I'll give Slay hit when I when I need to get after Darius, when he's Darius, I get after him. When I need to get it, when I need to talk to him like he's Slay, I'll tell him he's Slay. On this particular situation, he's Slay because he's right. He's right. Like that is not an easy change to go over no. for anybody. You you know, Kevin Byard, it looked like he he forgot how to play. I, I doubt that Kevin Byard, who was an all pro in this league and, and a really good player for a long time, just came here and forgot how to play. It it didn't make sense. Hassan Reddick, like different guys who disappeared, where you're like, where's this guy at all the whole time? You know, Zach Cunningham looked like he could play early in the year. But he, by the time right. Patricia got his hands on this defense, he looked <laughs> lost too. So now, like right. everything you said, wide open. All those things that we watched 
you know, from that second half of year on when we were just fighting to stay in games and win games close. And then right. that was the that was the weirdest decision I in in Eagles history that I remember of like, wait, what? Why do we we fight our defense coordinator? We're eleven and two. Like that was a weird whatever we were at the time. But you know, you know, you know what I mean? Like we we're firing we're firing our defense coordinator right now, and we're not even firing them. We're just putting them in the press box and right. Matt Patricia's now calling plays. It's really right. weird. And, I, and 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 you're right. The word is weird because I didn't – something else must have happened. There had to be some kind of internal disagreement or internal dysfunction because things weren't that bad when they made the change. Yes, the slide had begun, but it hadn't gotten that bad yet. They did play a couple of games where we thought they should have won or they shouldn't have gotten beaten the way they did, but it hadn't gotten that bad yet. So there had to have been some – and I think we're going to find out more information or get some more insight as to really what happened during that slide during that time the last six games of the season in 2023 we're going to find out some information maybe a couple of years down the road that we don't know right now because we keep trying to figure out why it it just listen i went through that when i was in miami uh my second year in miami and yes everybody hit the like button hit the subscribe button i see you putting that up there tom <laughs> Hit the subscribe. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the like button uh, and the notification button so you know when we're coming on here on HUD on Vetted on Thursday night. Listen, I w- we went through that my second year in Miami. 11 games in the season. I'm playing with Dan Marino. 11 games in the season, into the season, we're 9-2. and two. We had the best record in the NFL at that point. We were projected to make it to the Super Bowl, at least go deep into the playoffs. 9-2. and two. We didn't win a game the rest of the season. We lost the rest. Yeah, we lost the rest. It was like the Eagles. We lost the rest of our games. But during that slide, and it was horrible. It was horrible. It was. But during that slide, we didn't lose the same way the Eagles lost. You know, we were in every one of those games, and we fought in every one of those games. We didn't get beat by more than, you know, 10 points or 7 points. We were we were right there in each one of those games. We just we just went on a slide and we began to lose games and couldn't win games. A lot of it had to do with our defense. We couldn't stop guys uh, because we had some injuries. And then offensively, we had to score thirty points, thirty four points if we want to win. So uh, because we couldn't stop anybody, but we went on a slide and lost. But for the Eagles to go on the slide the way they went on, or, or the kind of slide they went on, and lose games, getting beat the way they were getting beat, which and I mean, handily, they were getting their behinds whooped. They were being punked. They were getting thrashed. They were they were being embarrassed to get beat that way in that many games in a row after having gone, like you said, they were what they were ten to three at one point. After being winning like that and then getting beat that way, there was just there was something not right about it. There was something that just didn't smell right about it. That we just couldn't figure out that was going on that I think at some point we'll really find out later on down the road. Somebody's going to open their mouth and let us know what was really going on because something, something that was something sour was really happening with that team that was not being revealed that we didn't know about. They did a good job of keeping it a secret. Oh, they absolutely did. Whatever was going on down there, because there was definitely disgruntled, disgruntled players, Seem like coaches, everybody was. You don't, you just don't lose the way they started losing, and something more is not going on. And and right. some of the reports that you, you hear, you you question a little bit too, like Jalen Jalen going off script. You know you, that's concerning to hear. I never want to yeah. hear that. Right now, if right. It, we'll find out if it's true one day. Hopefully, it's not. Right, hopefully not, because that's now I could see that happening because I thought that relationship was too close. Right, him right. and Brian Johnson. Right. There, there isn't such thing as too close to a player, right? Where now right. you can't, you can't, you can't criticize him the way you would just a just a, a different quarterback because of your relationship. Some guys right. can't coach, like they can't, they can't separate their feelings and their job at times when you're that close to a player. Not saying that's what yeah. happened, but you might let him get away with stuff that you wouldn't let somebody else get away with, or that guy thinks he can get away with stuff. That uh, nobody else would think they can get away with. That's that's worrisome. That doesn't seem like that's something Jalen would do. But you still right. hear that, and you're like, uh oh, I don't like to hear that one. 
Right, right. But then when you talk about going off script, that that I'm thinking about that long play in the two minute drive where they had two timeouts left and they only only needed to get about mm, two, I think it was like twelve yards. And Jalen and AJ Brown decided to go deep, and Jalen threw that interception, and really that that was the end of the game. When all they had to do was get a first down, they had two timeouts, get a first down, kick the field goal, tie the game, and give themselves a chance to win the game. So going off strip, I'd never in 17 years of playing in the NFL, I'd never ever saw a quarterback make a decision like that to throw the ball downfield when you're in a position like that in a two-minute drill where you only need 12 yards, you got two timeouts, that's that's a no-brainer. That really is an idiotic decision by both of them. Now, whether they were doing that and made that decision to, uh, to, to be combative against the coach, you know, just working against him and doing that on purpose, which, like you said, that doesn't seem like the character that Jalen Hurts had. Maybe AJ Brown, but not, but not, but not Jalen. That just doesn't seem. That's out of character for Jalen, for him to go against the court coach like that and to operate outside of the sequence of norm, normality when it comes to two minute drive. I mean, they really lost the game on that play, and that was the decision between AJ Brown and Jalen Hurts. I don't know if Jalen coached uh, or AJ coached Jalen into throwing the ball or what, but. That was that was really bad, and when we found it, and then they tried to cover it up. Remember, remember that because <laughs> Sirianni is in the uh, press conference after, afterwards talking about, well, you know, we thought we'd get a pass interference. What? <laughs> yeah, what does that what does that even mean? <laughs> to find out when AJ Brown did his interview that he threw Sirianni under the bus and said, no, that was what me and Jalen did. <laughs> <laughs> now, so so that's just that lets you know. There was a bunch of crap going on in that locker room between the coaches and the players. When you when you're not all saying the same thing and you're all not backing one another up, there's division. There's division. I was waiting for the Super Bowl hangover at some point. The the sneak in here to open the door oh. and say hello last year, and I just thought right. it wasn't going to happen. At one point, I was like, you know what? This team just finds ways to win. That's what Jalen Hurts is. This is the this is what they built here, and and that's who they are, right? That's their identity. Right. And then all of a sudden, you can't you say that for like two or three weeks because you're beating good teams. Like you beat the Kansas City Chiefs in Arrowhead. You came back here. You were in a dog fight with the Bills at one point, right? You smoked the Dolphins when they came here. I mean, you had a lot of like unlike 2022, 2023. There were some signature wins in there where people right. couldn't take them away from you. So you were like, well, you can say however whatever you want about the way we're winning. We're still winning, and we're beating quality teams too. And then to have that kind of fall from from grace like that is, is something I I haven't seen. Like I haven't seen a team that I thought was that tough right. just fall apart like that that fast. And that's why Howie, you know, backs against the wall this whole off season. And you can see it when when he gets cornered or get put or gets put in his office or his closet, I should say. Right? That you see a different <laughs> Howie. You see Howie season, and this is what season we're in. Because he's he's done an A plus job so far. It, well, yeah, he's, he's done more than anybody else in free agency. Yeah, he's signing guys, he's bringing guys in, particularly at the linebacker position. It's going to be interesting interesting to see what he does in the draft. I you know, you know I, he he might listen. He might surprise us and draft the linebacker in the first round. Don't don't be surprised. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he does it. I will be surprised if he does it, but I won't be surprised if he does it. But as far as the Eagles getting tired and falling, because they kind of use that as a reason, I guess, or an excuse in, in terms of what happened last year towards the latter part of the season. But think about this. The Kansas City Chiefs have won back-to-back Super Bowls, right? The Kansas City Chiefs have played more games than anybody else in the last two years. They, they played the playoffs last year, 2022, and won the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. They went to a wild card game in 2023, or I should say 2024, you know, during that playoff time. They they played wild card and went on the road and won and still won the Super Bowl. So and they and they had a floundering going on. I think in the middle of the season, we kind of wrote the Kansas City Chiefs off. 
They were Absolutely. struggling in the middle of the season last year, and we were like, oh, yeah, they're done. And here they are. They got it together. They pulled it together, went on a run in the latter part of the season. Wild card win, division win, conference win, Super Bowl win. So no, they, they remove any excuse that anybody has for getting tired because they played more games than any other team in the NFL in the last two years. And greatness doesn't get tired, years. right? Greatness doesn't get tired of winning. Right. That, that, right. You know, and I mean, that's, you, that's what my – you got it or you don't. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, he's he's different. He's different. And Andy's different too, right? I mean, Andy is, is a great coach, great coach, all-time great coach for the amount of winning he's done. So when you got those right. two figureheads at the top of your organization and spags, you know, you're – you know, that's why it's actually funny that I wrote them off and other people did at one point, right? Like right, when you look right, back, you're like, right. wow, wrote them off? I, don't, I mean, look at me. I'm, right, I'm like writing Jordan off? No way. Nobody ever did that. But, but what you say, they're different. And you're right. 100% absolutely right. They are different. But what makes them different? Here's the di- What makes them different? In your, in your opinion, what makes Patrick Mahomes? What makes Andy Reid? What makes Michael Jordan? What makes them different? It's not that they have, I mean, everybody at that level has great talent. That's why they're at the professional level, because they have great talent. What makes them different? The one, two, the be great, right? The one, the mind. two, this, the one, two, the mind, the brain, right? The mind, yes. The psychological. Yeah. I tell that at the athletes the all the time. When when we like back in my day, I'm like we didn't have a sports psychiatrist in the in the dugout, right? Like now we we understand that our minds are so powerful, and they're definitely yes. powerful when it comes to that. Right, right, and that's what sets them apart: their mindset, their ability to focus, their ability to will. It's called willing themselves to victory, to will themselves. I mean, look at Patrick Mahomes last year in the Super Bowl versus against the Eagles. When he went into halftime, I'm saying to myself, this cat is done. He ain't coming back out. I mean, because he was crying on the sidelines, man. The trainer came over to him and tried to look at his ankle. He was like, he was screaming. I'm like, this cat is done. And he willed himself back on the field and had a crucial one on one leg to, to, to sustain a drive to get them to, to bring them to a victory last year against the Eagles. It's, it's, a mentality that you got to have, that you got to sustain. And again, that was warped. That became fractured last year, I believe, when it comes to the Eagles in terms of the relationship with the uh, the quarter the quarterback, not the quarterback, but the players and the coaches, and their ability to translate that or transform that or get that to to show up on the field. It just it just uh, fell apart, and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And they knew uh, it wasn't going to get better. And it's a it's a belief in that guy too, right? That's a, right. you know you know the same thing Brady had. Obviously, it's a belief yep. that you know we're gonna win, we're gonna win. And when you believe that, and a guy you know the guy across from you has the same talent you have, but you but you believe it more, right? You got a better chance mm-hmm. of taking that ball fifty to the house. You got a better chance right. of beating one on one coverage. You, you know it just it brings out a different. It's hard to explain, right? It's hard. That's one's like a hard to explain, but you just. It's part of the game that isn't talked about enough is that belief right. and knowing that this guy that I'm playing with is, you know, he's going to get me the ball in, in that spot, whatever it is, you know? Uh, it, and it starts, you know, it starts with the leaders. Let's take Patrick Mahomes, for example. You know, you got guys that are playing with him on the field and it's a tough situation, whether it was during the middle of the season for them, they're floundering around losing games or whether it's on the run uh, as they're ascending towards the latter part of the season. They see him performing. They see him producing. They see him overcoming tough situations, whether it's a, a, almost a sack and he's parallel to the ground, he's throwing the ball and he's caught. All that's all those antics that you see him do, what that does, that is, if I'm a receiver and I'm seeing my quarterback, man, I got to pick it up. That inspires me. Listen, he's doing that. Let me, let me do my thing. I, I'm going to play greater. I'm going to play better. And that's how it translates over onto the field, greatness and great minds that have great ability do that for their teammates. And that's what Patrick Mahomes does. That's what Michael Jordan did. 
That's what we're looking for Jalen Hurts to do. For whatever reason, Jalen got in a stupor at the latter part of the season. A big reason why the team didn't come through and fell apart the way they did was because Jalen became, I don't want to say complacent because I don't know what his mindset was, but he came very, very normal. He wasn't an abnormal or or above average quarterback in the latter part of the season like he had been the year before. He became a very, very normal, inactive, uh, instead of proactive quarterback. And he is the one that the team looks to. Jalen is the one who sparks the team. Jalen is the one who gets things going. He does things on offense, and that helps to encourage the defense and, in, and inspire them to do things defensively. But that's not what was happening. And I believe that had a lot to do with, like you said, what was happening with him and the offensive coordinator, Brian Johnson, and Sirianni, I believe had a lot to do with that. I think Sirianni should have been fired this year. They, I don't know what his role is going to be this year with Vic Fangio there and, uh, you know, Kellen Moore. I don't know what he's going to be doing. They talk about a culture, you know, him creating. I don't, I don't understand this culture thing. The culture for professional football is get your ass out on the field and win. That's what the culture is. Yeah, that's what the culture is, yeah. And, what I mean, what it, culture are they talking about? What are you talking about culture? We're not changing diapers. We're not trying to, you know – Give bottles to babies. What are you talking about, culture? It does. It doesn't make sense. It, nothing yeah, makes it sense. Make sense. Nothing makes sense. Nothing. Everything they said this year. So, where's Sirianni, the CEO of the football team this year? Like you got the CEO and, and president and owner and Jeffrey Lurie. So what? So what is what is Nick Sirianni this year? The CEO of the coaching staff? Because that's what it looks like to me. It looks like to right. me. I brought guys in because he wasn't able to overcome. The, the lack of stability there. And my biggest problem is I got an offensive, I got an offensive head coach who got hired because of his offensive game plan. And my offense looks like that. I can wrap my head around my defense falling. I can't wrap my head around my offense. I know Jeffrey Lurie can't either because he wants to score points. Right. So when he was watching that from afar, this is why Saquon Barkley's here. And this is why, you know, you do the types of moves you made this offseason because he's not going to just settle. He's not going to settle with whatever that was, 10 points a game through that stretch. Yeah. It felt like. <laughs> and it was. It was, it was. it was bad. It was really bad. Um, I'm going to predict this. Saquon, and I believe this is, again, similar to – I can relate to Saquon's story. I, was, I spent nine years in New England and was not really utilized as a wide receiver like I was when I went to Miami or like I was when I was in Philly. Or like I was when I was in Washington. I did a lot of blocking. I know I was a, a wingback coming out of college. But uh, I did a lot of blocking when I was in New England. And we didn't run a prolific or pro-type throwing offense. We ran the ball old school to in order to throw the ball. So I didn't get a lot of passes for nine years in New England. I went to Miami, man. It was like being born again. It was like being born again again. I learned... I really did. I learned after nine years in the NFL, I learned when I got to Miami how to be a professional wide receiver because we, the things they were doing in Miami, we didn't do none of that in New England. None of it. All the balls, yeah. the kind of routes they were running, how much they – none of that. All of that was new. When I got to Miami, all of that was new to me. I'm like, Nice wow, having Dan this, too, right? Right? Like then you yeah. go from a, a real yeah. quarterback? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so – I say that to say this about Saquon. The same thing for him in, 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 in New York with the Giants. He never really had an opportunity to flourish because the whole load was on him. Never really had a good offensive line. Never really had talent around him to take, all the, take some of the pressure off of him. You know, they could focus. Defenses could focus on him, stack the middle, put guys in the block, and stop the run. Never really had a, a prolific quarterback that could do a whole – I mean, you know, they got Jones now, but it never was like that for him. Saquon always had to carry load. Focus offensively was always on him when a defense is uh, planning their defensive scheme. Now, now he comes to a team that has talent all over the place offensively, quarterback, tight end, wide receivers, running back. He's going to catch the ball. Can you imagine the RPOs with Saquon Barkley now? 
They're going to miss if the they run it. Was sick. If oh, they run gonna, it, well, unlike last well, year. Well, listen to me now. One of the things that's not going to happen this year in 2024 that happened in 2023 is the Eagles will not shy away from the run as the season goes on. You know why? I know they did it last year with Swift. And Swift, at the beginning of the year, I think the four, first four, maybe even five games, Swift was getting down. He was he was toting that rock, and he was having a great season until they stopped giving him the ball. They just literally – it's not that he wasn't running the ball. They stopped giving him the ball, giving him yep. the ball, calling runner plays for whatever reason. They won't do that. Why? Because the offensive coordinator – and the head coach knows we got Saquon Barkley on our team. <laughs> we got Saquon Bar- They're not going to not give the ball to Saquon Barkley. They didn't make this move during the offseason in free agency not to give Saquon Barkley the ball. So that's not going to happen, whether they get him the ball in quick passes out of the backfield or whether they hand it to him out of the backfield. They're not going to forget about the fact that they have a great running back who has awesome potential of breaking it at any time in the backfield by the name of Saquon Barkley. They forgot about Swift, but I promise you, it's not going to happen this year with Saquon Barkley in the back. And Saquon's not going to have to say anything. If it starts happening, Saquon doesn't have to say anything. His What he's done in the past and his work in the past, his name in and of itself is going to remind them, oh, yeah, we got a running back. We got to give him the ball. That's going to happen. And he's going to get the ball. He'll probably have the third. Your AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, he'll be third in catches this year. Oh, absolutely. I think that's a big part. Yeah, he'll that be are, third in receptions. Yeah. And and Irv, you know it, right? Like I think the biggest importance of an upgrade over from Saquon to DeAndre is he's a three down running back, which there isn't a right. ton of those in the league. So now as a defense, I can't just scheme easily or it would be easier to scheme against saying, Well, right. that's their third down back. They're throwing they're throwing the football. Now I don't know. I don't know what they're doing when they're doing it as easy as I could potentially with that direction. But just his ability out of the backfield to catch catch passes is something that's really underrated here. And with this offensive line and the guy and the, the two wide receivers alone, and right. Jalen Hurts, who has the ability to run the football too, that RPO yep. game can be the most dangerous Ooh. thing in football. Like, I don't want to have yes, to stop sir. that. I got to stop. It's different from Lamar and Derrick Henry. There's a difference here. Because now linebackers freezes for a second with Saquon running through right. running through the right. tackle. Uh, good luck if you freeze, because now he just went fifty. See you later, and you got to respect that. You got to respect the quarterback too, running the football. So this is this guy has a potential to be really dangerous. And Saquon Barkley has a potential to rush for two thousand yards. He just does. Oh. You know, it, oh, now, I, that's a lot. Yeah, gain two thousand. Whether it's pass at the addition, you know, when you add the pass and the run together that he's going to accumulate next year, he'll probably have 2,000 yards, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But the other thing, here's the other thing, and I think we're, yep, we're at 9-15. Here's the other thing about Saquon that I really haven't heard anybody mention in any of the, you know, sports shows or any of the so-called sports experts. One of, one of the other things that Saquon brings to the table with regards to his abilities as a running back is Saquon will step up in the pocket and stone that blitzer. He, he's going to be able – he's do, done it before. He does it. He's a great blitz pickup blocker. So we need that. We didn't have that. I don't know how many times I saw Swift miss a blitz pickup from the backfield and cause Jalen to have to move from his spot in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the pocket. Saquon's going to step up and stone that linebacker or stone that corner or stone that safety who's coming up there trying to blitz. And that's something that we didn't have last year because we had a lot of problems trying to defend the blitz and trying to move the ball against the blitz. Saquon brings that to the table as well as, you know, being able to catch the ball out of the backfield, being able to run the ball at a high level and all the other things that he brings. Another elite offensive lineman, right? It's essentially another elite offensive lineman. Up there to help protect your quarterback. So yes, yep. definitely. And that's like that's like that's like tackling for for a cornerback or a safety. You got to want to do it. it yeah, it's want a to. decision you got to make to to pick up that blitz like that. And Saquon, I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it against us. I've seen him do it against other teams. 
he's he's a back that does that that steps up in the pocket and and running backs have to be able to do that you got to be able to pick up the blitz pick up that blitzer and stone him stop him from getting to the quarterback and he does that he does that so um so are you excited before we get out of here are you excited about this year or not quite are you still being cautious oh i'm jacked up let's go (laughs) Right. I mean, you can't you can't sign a guy like that, you know, and much as we could do shows leading into the season once a week just talking about Saquon Barkley and his impact on this offense and this entire football team. You know, you that that signing right there got obviously took me to another level. But what really showed me a lot was bringing CJ GJ back because that's right. that kind of toughness you need on your defense. A guy that we yep, miss. And I like that you can put your tail between your legs and say, we made a mistake here. He can do the same thing. Say, hey, I made a mistake, too. You both both parties know. Hey, I we both made a mistake, and you rekindle that. That shows me a lot about this organization and their ability to put things in the past, move on from things, and then be able to bring a guy back. I, I love what they've done this all season. I'm not cautious at all. Like they're they're built to they're built to be a top one two seed in the NFC, and if they're not, then then obviously it's not that we were fooled. It, the only reason would stop us. Is them or Jalen not being good enough? Like it's right. you know, it, it rides on Jalen. This is Jalen's year to go be a top five MVP candidate because he has to be with this type of firepower around him. And, and he was last year until they the slide until the slide. You know, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Year, he was he was the top candidate for the MVP. You know, he was like one in voting in terms of what everybody was saying until they started the slide. So he was doing that. And not really having a great year. He was just kind of not not managing the team, but just, you know, he was playing and had his flashes, had his moments. I saw him throw a couple of passes last year that were freaking unbelievable that, uh, you know, I didn't know he could do that. So he has the ability. And this, this team next year, and I'm excited like you, Tom, I am, because I see uh, the team making moves. Harry Roseman trying to fill some of these – Areas that we have weakness in, particularly on defense, the linebacker position. Uh, we still White, need yep. another. I think we still need another safety. I think we still need another corner. Um, now that Bradbury has shown that he really has, I don't know if it's because of the system and all of the the moving around and the changes that took place last year. You know, they put Bradbury in a position where he really he really doesn't play well in the slot. He can't play in the slot. They had him in the slot. He doesn't play well unless he's got that sideline next to him. And he's got some help over the top from the safety. Then that's what he does. Cover two is what he did when he was with the Giants. That's what he does best. That's what we did last year in 2022 uh, when um, when Gannon was here. Um, they made sure that he played a lot of cover two and kept people in front of him. That's why he was successful. But when they started moving him around this past year, no, he's not. He doesn't play well in space. So I don't know. I guess they're going to keep him on the team and see what he can turn out to be with Fangio's defense. But this defense for the Eagles, and I'm excited about the year because the defense doesn't have to be a top-ranked defense. If they can play, or I guess they do have to be a top rank, but if they can play in the top 10, 10 or 12, they can be the 10th best or 12th best defense in the league, what we have on offense will handle the rest. That's that's all the defense needs to do is to be somewhere Great. between 12 and 10 in that, that top 12 somewhere not down to the bottom, but if you can be in the top 10 or 12 in terms of defense in the league, they're going to play good enough offensively because of what, what we have and this new changes we're going to make. Uh, and Keller Moore coming in with this prolific offense and mixing that with the, uh, with the, the run in the pass and the RPOs and all of that. Man, we should keep defenses guessing all year long. And we should be able to score points and get this team back on track to where it was in 2022. So I'm excited. I'm excited. I got really excited when Saquon Barkley was brought on board uh, in free agency. And, um, man, that was just a move that Howie Roseman did that surprised everybody. Everybody. And the two and the two hires of the – it started with two hires of coordinators, right? right. You went out and got right. pros at those positions so in those right. spots. Right. And I'm excited to see what Vic can do with his defense and the addition of Devin White, too, that I left out right. of there that I think can have a great year and sort of find himself again like he was in Tampa. So I'm well, excited. Had, I mean, when Devin White had that great year in T- uh, Tampa, he had some people around him and he'll have people around him this year. So he, he should be able to play fast and play hard and be as productive as he was a couple of years ago 
Uh, people say he's tailed off a little bit, but that's because he lost some of the talent around him and the type of defense that they have, you know, blitzing defense that they running down well, there. Vita Bay, uh, right? Vita Bay. I don't know Vita Bay is health this past year, right? Well, but Vita Bay was a big piece in them right. being able to stop the run like they did. Hopefully Jordan Davis can have that same impact for Devin White. That right, Go back, circle back to the poll where we get out of here. But hopefully Jordan Davis can have that same impact Vita Bay had for Devin White in, right. in Tampa. And but either way, he's a tremendous, he's an elite athlete. It's just about him playing smart football. And I think Vic can hopefully hone him in. And a one year deal, a one year deal should hopefully hone anybody in um, that's trying to make money and keep their career going. So he's mm-hmm. he's uber talented. That's yep. not going to be a problem. Well, that's what the linemen are supposed to do. That's the, that's uh, Jordan Davis' job: keep those linemen and the backs off of those linebackers. Let those linebackers run freely and fill those gaps and stop the run and get pressure on the quarterback. So we'll see if it happens. We'll see. We got – look, it's going to be here pretty soon. I know we got a few months to go, but it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it won't be long. Before we know it. Before we know it. Well, listen, that was cool, man. I appreciate you being on. We went a little bit over time, but uh, that's what we do on A2D Radio right here on Vetted. Um, we'll be back next week when Hollis is back in town. I don't know where Hollis is right now. He's somewhere doing something. He's not doing this. I know that. But he'll be back <laughs> next week, next Thursday. 815. We thank Tom Tom Arnon. That's the boss too, y'all, by the way. This is the boss man. Came in and filled in, stepping up where it was needed. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Wow, thanks for being I, I ran my mouth most of the time, but it's all right. <laughs> hey, it's your show. I gotta do one tomorrow too. So I can be like I, I it was nice to be the the not the not host and just sit. Okay. Right? It felt good. Not host. It felt good. Yeah, it felt great not to host. It's like it's great. Okay. It feels cool. great. I'm glad. I'll, well, I appreciate you filling in when when I was I got tired. My jaw got tired. I had to rest. Yeah, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Good co-host. <laughs> All right, y'all. Listen, we'll see. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the like button. Uh, hit the notification button for vetted right here on A2D Radio. We'll be back next week on Thursday, 8:15. PM right here, A2D Radio. This is Vetted. I'm Irving Fryer. It's Tom Unknown. That is the boss. I'm just one of the players, one of the two picks in the box. <laughs>